State of the Nation with Zororo Makamba. After many months of talk, after a lot of delays, it has finally happened. The Zimbabwe Investment and Development Agency is now a reality. Finally. What does this all mean? What difference does it make? How can we make it work better than the symptoms that we had all along? What is Zeta anyway? Well, let's talk about it on this week's State of the Nation. The President has signed Zeta into law. This was always one of his biggest promises. It's one of the major bills that his office worked on after he became president. But what is it all about? Well, this is something that's supposed to change the way we deal with both foreign and local investors. Remember, Zimbabwe doesn't rank very highly on the ease of doing business index. Yes, we've seen some improvement over the past couple of years, but we're still far behind other countries. One of the reasons why we are behind, too much red tape. Investors had to go from one office to the other just to set up shop here. This is what the Zimbabwe Investment Development Agency will try sort out. So let's go step by step with this. Let's say you're a company trying to invest in a mine in Gwanda. Before, here's what you needed. You needed a permit from the Zimbabwe Investment Authority. You needed a license from the Ministry of Mines. You had to go to the Environmental Management Authority for another license. Then you had to go to the RBZ. Then you had to go to NASA to sort out staff issues. Then you also needed an export license, so you had to go to the Ministry of Trade. You then had to go to the Export Processing Zone Authority to apply for a special license. And on and on and on it went. Nobody wants all this. It also leads to corruption. So now, if you're that investor, you can do all of this at one place. You can get all your licenses under one roof at Zeta. Now we no longer have separate entities like the Zimbabwe Special Economic Zones Authority or the Zimbabwe Investment Authority. This will all be under Zeta. And to invest in Gwanda, you no longer have to travel all the way to Harare just to submit your papers. Because of the devolution policy, Zeta will be decentralized too. It also seeks to protect investments from any unfair treatment or takeovers. For example, nobody should be rocking up to your company when you take it from you. So that's what Zeta is about. It's meant to make it easier for investors to do business. Now comes the hard part, implementation. Firstly, Zeta is now looking for a CEO. We want to see a competent person there. We need someone who will give us confidence. We're tired of the old men in parastatals. Did someone mention Zessa? We need a fresh face with fresh ideas. We want Zeta to have a strong online presence. Zeta is a great step, a new step. Now let's make sure that the vision behind it is implemented right. How do you know when you're near a government office? Well, you start sneezing. <laughs> have you seen the amount of paper that are in those offices? Mountains and mountains of big files and paper. Spending time in there is never good for one's health. Now finally, they're working to change all of this. And starting from the top of government, the government has launched the e-cabinet. Now, what this does is try to cut out the amount of paper used by cabinet. They want to go paperless. Ministers now have a common view of documents being discussed. They can edit them in real time. The backend system allows communication between the secretariat, the chief secretary, and the cabinet room. It was also designed by local developers. This is part of a broader program, the e-government plan. What this is supposed to do is to modernize the public sector. If we use more IT, we make government more efficient. It costs less and it cuts out the risk of corruption. Think about this. We're talking about an online passport application system, e-taxation, filling all your papers and paying your taxes to Zimra online, applying for a shop license online, online visa application forms for people coming into the country. We've already heard about the registration of civil servants via the biometric system. That helps cut out ghost workers. At the VID, they've started a pilot project where you can now use the computer to apply for a provisional driver's license. And that's what we want to see. We have to cut down on human interaction and doing some basic things. We all know what happens if you don't do this. Corruption. But we need to do this quickly. This is 2020. And why are our ministers still using Gmail? It's embarrassing. Have you heard about these two organizations, Zarnet and GISP? Both of these are supposed to provide internet and email to our government. Why aren't they doing this? And don't bother trying Googling them. Their websites work when they want. The 2020 budget put aside 341 million to make government IT systems more modern. This must happen. I mean, what's up with the big exercise books that we see in every government office you visit? You have to manually write your name. This is also a security risk. You see who came before you and who came after you. Or maybe we're just afraid that those old Sakurus who we see at the government reception will lose their jobs. Great to see some action on this. Our local developers have the solutions too. So let's put them to work. Zisco Revival on course. 
David Whitehead to resume operations. How many times have you seen these headlines? A lot. We all have an emotional attachment to some of these old industries. It makes sense. They remind us of the time when we had a strong industrial base. Talk about the steel from Cisco, textiles from David Whitehead, tires from Dunlop, glass from Zimglass. There are many of these names, many more. So when we hear anybody talk about reviving them, of course we sit up and listen. But here's something to think about. Some of these companies were big 25 or 30 or even 40 years ago. It was a different time. Can we really take them back to their former glory in 2020? It's not like time stood still when they closed. Times have changed. Technology has moved on. When we talk about reviving these companies, are we also talking about new technology? Can these companies really compete in today's environment? Surely, if we're going to bring them back, they have to come back with a different game plan altogether. Here's an example. David Whitehead used to be our biggest textile company. It used to export textiles all over the world. They made clothes for local companies. That was then. Today, a Chinese factory can make a t-shirt at a cost of $1. Now, can David Whitehead do the same? Hmm, they used to make those Van Hoosian shirts, remember? Can they make these at an affordable price? Can Zisco make steel cheaper than China? Two billion US dollars, that's how much our companies need every year to replace old machinery. This is according to the CZI. Because we have old machinery, we're less efficient and more expensive. It's great being nostalgic about old companies, but maybe it's time to start thinking about new things. Look at Ethiopia. They decided they cannot compete with China when it comes to textiles. So they're building these big industrial parks. They invite the Chinese companies to partner with them. Now Ethiopia will become a big major exporter. These are some of the new ideas we need. The point is, we have to look at today's reality. And the reality is this. While it's great to revive these old giants, it's also time that we start thinking harder about building new ones. The world has changed. Our view of industry must change too.